Welcome, everybody. We are in uh, week four of June's Exploitation. It is Revenge Day, and we're picking something a little bit more mainstream than the other choices that we've had earlier in the month. But it's a movie I'm really excited to talk about because it's like a seminal summer movie of mm -hmm. my youth. Um, that's 1995's Die Hard with a Vengeance. I have like such a long history with this movie. I don't even know where to begin. I enjoy this movie a hell of a lot. Uh, it does a couple things different than the first I heard. It's not just retreading the formula that we talked about on uh, the cliffhanger episode a couple weeks ago and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, I love uh, the way it uses, I hate to say it like this, but the way it uses New York City as a character. Um, sure. I love the, the banter with Samuel L. Jackson. Um, my point with that is that you can feel it. You can feel that it's mm -hmm. a fully formed idea that wasn't just coasting on, well, John McClane will just come in and do things, which I feel like a lot of the later sequels do. Yeah, so I, I was kind of in this weird place with Die Hard with a Vengeance for a few years where this was mainly manifested from when A Good Day to Die Hard came out. I saw all five movies in a row in one day in a movie theater leading up to the premiere of the fifth one. And it was like diminishing returns to the max type sure. of day for me. And I got this narrative in my head around the time where John McClane outruns the the mass of water in the in the in the drain where yeah. i'm just like well he's kind of like superhuman now and before this like it was within the realm of realism and uh -huh. i think that that's when i thought that the movie quote unquote jumped the shark but like i feel i i don't agree with that anymore for a couple of reasons one is just because i keep you know banking on this like summer thrills thing I'm and it's like and we'll get to that in august where you're doing a whole month dedicated oh, to yeah. summer thrills and there's no better summer thrills movie under that strict definition of like let me watch something kind of super wall-to-wall actiony exciting mm -hmm. maybe speed that's about it it's the classic remote dropper but the other thing too is i feel the same way about the original indiana jones trilogy as i do the original Die Hard trilogy where i think they work best not as a marathon you should just watch them individually yeah and when you've watched when you watch die hard 2 by itself or you watch die hard with a vengeance by itself i think it that maximizes the enjoyment that you'll get out of it it's almost like a movie that works well like with commercial breaks because okay. it's, so, it's so many small stories you know what i mean yeah. like, they got to go here then they do this and then they go to this thing then they go there it's always moving the narrative is always moving kind of like what you said with speed where there's always something new happening in speed there's always some kind of new challenge well which is true of the first i heart but it's much more leisurely in its storytelling it's much more mm. about the you know the sort of the action in between the narrative bits where this one is constantly simon says do this simon says do that we got to figure out this puzzle we gotta figure out that and it kind of works well with little breaks I, I sincerely believe this is one of the better action scripts of this period. I mean, I really do believe because, um, especially considering yeah. it's a two-hander with with McLean and with Zeus, but both of them always have something to do. Like movies like this will will often have will introduce the Samuel L. Jackson character, and then they'll sort of sideline him for a while because we need to create stakes for the hero. But Zeus always has something to do. He's always off doing something, even if it's with McLean or not. In fact, one of my favorite parts of the movie is where um, they split up, and and mm. Samuel L. Jackson goes to Yankee Stadium, and then they have to come. Like it's kind of about how they come back together. It's not a huge like important you know gravitational narrative thing, but it's just cool to say like, oh, I hope they get back together. Like I found yeah. myself thinking that having seen this movie 50 times so i just i think it's really a testament to the writing this movie does a lot of things really well that look easy but are done really poorly in other action movies like this i mean like one thing that's nice about it is there's a lot of variety to mm -hmm. the different action sequences and the different challenges that they have and to your point the, the script like the story itself and the plot is kind of clever in sort of a way that you don't expect until like they, the the reveal of what Jeremy Irons is really up to right. happens about an hour in and that's the first time we see him we hear him obviously much more ahead of that but it's almost like clever in the fact that it's like 
oh, they're getting away with this a second time. Yeah, exactly. And we didn't pick this up. And it sort of like does it in a sort of really ingenious misdirect. And I think that the, you know, the screenplay by Jonathan Hensley, who later went on to become a director of, of several movies, um, it's pretty, I, I think the best thing that could have happened is he didn't go into this movie writing a diehard script. This exactly. was a script that he wrote that was originally supposed to be the sequel for Rapid Fire. Right. Um, but then Brandon Lee passed away, of course. And then uh, Joel Silver was trying to buy it for Lethal Weapon, Weapon. which I, I don't know how that would have worked. They would have had to rework it a lot. Yeah. But um, but uh, he he couldn't he couldn't acquire it. So then Andrew Vanya, who was the new producer of the Die Hard series, uh, picked it up at Fox and it became a Die Hard movie. But I think like not going into it with the pressure of like, this is who John McClane is and stuff like that um, right. allows them some flexibility of the story. And also, I want to get your take on this because I used to have a gripe about two, basically two, two and a half major things about the McClane character in this. One is um, he, I, I, the alcoholism and him be, being separated from Holly McLean, mm -hmm. I think are just kind of a bummer. And it feels like something that's kind of cruel to the character who like really didn't deserve that. And then also, and I get it's a new wrinkle, but like, I don't know yeah. what effect it has. And then also, and I've, I've settled on this a little bit more than I used to. I used to hate the racial uh, antagonism mm -hmm. in this movie um, because we were never led to believe at any point in Die Hard 1 or 2 that John McClane had harbored any, you know, racist or prejudiced feelings. Right. But the thing that I'm thinking, I thought on this turn is it almost doesn't matter it's just if you're setting a movie in new york city in 1995 you have to it would almost seem insincere to not um to basically just kind of whitewash that there could be this tension and, and, and also that yeah. beat is about zeus it's not about john mcclain it's about yeah. zeus. it's zeus's character arc, you know and, yeah. and, and i mean also remembering the very you know the circumstances of their meeting at the beginning of the movie with the, the, the big placard board scene um you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, so i mean that part bothers me like i i think it's just sensationalistic you know and it deals with it's i mean i get i i get the time yeah. and place and maybe at the time and place it made more sense um but it, if you're not gonna, it, it's an explosive element, no pun intended, to to put out there if you're not going to give it its due diligence. But that's not what this movie's for. So I yeah, don't know. yeah. I mean, I think that there's also it's also twenty, thirty years later. It's also <laughs> we were much more careful with things like that. Whereas I yeah. think these were a little bit more leisurely about it in the '90s and before. Um, yeah. If anything, it sort of was, it felt like a throwback to me to like 70s New York movies where yeah. it's like, like, like in a way that I was never really conscious of. Like, and I mean, especially considering New York is, again, so much of the texture. I love the way this movie uses the city. I love the way yeah. Yeah. The, the city is, much like Nakatomi Plaza was sort of, you were keeping track of the, the floors and all the people on the different floors and where everybody was, was and the geography of everything. I love the way it's like, it's like, um, uh, you know, Men in Black being a New York movie. Like, I think this is a wonderful New York movie as well, just like in terms of using the texture of the city, the characters in the city. Um, to your first point, though, I love that John McClane is hungover for this whole movie. Okay. Um, I think there's something really fun. The, the, the movie doesn't use it, with the exception of like the aspirin and all that, like there's reference to it. Um, I, I really like that because he's doing the whole thing with a hangover. But I also do feel, speaking to the, the cruelty, you know, with the, the separation, I... I think that's John McClane. I think the the mm -hmm. cyclical nature of his life, the fact that he keeps screwing up the same things over and over again because he's got yeah. this sort of self-destructive tendency, um, makes him endearing. You know, in the same way you mentioned Indiana yeah. Jones earlier, whereas Indiana Jones is sort of never really in control and he's always sort of happenstancing his way through his adventures. I really like that if we're going to keep coming back to John McClane, I like that self-destructive element to him. Um, and I like that it ends on the phone call. You know what I mean? Like, I like yeah. that it ends with him, like, you know, the, the arc with Samuel L. Jackson saying, like, look, just give her a call, man. Like, we're just going to be stubborn. Well, she's stubborn. Yeah, get over it. Like, yeah. 
you know? I, I, I think maybe it's more like I'm just bummed because I like John McClane I and I don't want him to be what in the place that he is. But it's sort of, and I, 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 I'm curious to rewatch Live Free or Die Hard. I haven't seen it in a number of years, but um, the he has a monologue that I'll always remember in the car with Justin Long, where he, you know, Justin Long is kind of blowing smoke up his butt because of like his heroism, and he right. saved him in like this action sequence. And John McClane's, I'll always remember he's like, you know what being a hero is? It means like eating all of your meals alone and exactly. stuff like that. And it's basically like you can't function as a normal human being if you're going to be, you know, the first one to run into this, to into these challenges. And I always thought that that was like a really kind of it for its place in the franchise and the fourth movie, really kind of thoughtful and introspective and interesting. And you probably wouldn't get there unless you had this bridge of the character with John McClane and Absolutely. in the third movie. But um. Yeah, I mean, I, I love what you said about, you know, New York. It's like, it's so great to see a movie that uses a real location and uses it well. And there's so much variety to what they're doing. And it's not just the geography. It's the yeah. attitude of the characters, the interplay between the police chiefs and the principals of the schools and all that stuff. Like, it is so much about the New York attitude being a part of how they go about their business, the terrorists and the heroes going through both. Yeah. And I, I also think it's like the movie should get credit for reinventing the diehard formula because, yeah. you know, you could say it's diehard in New York City, but like that's way different than like Not really. all, all. So like you had diehard in a building, you had diehard at the airport, but then like between Die Hard 2 and Die Hard with a Vengeance, you had Under Siege and you had Passenger 57 and you had right. Speed and you had like all these other, you know, um, movies that were borrowing from that formula and Die Hard with a Vengeance is just like, we're going to turn the hourglass over and it's going to be a completely different type of challenge for John McClane. And I know that's something that a lot of people would count as a strike against Die Hard with a Vengeance, right? We've heard that before. Yeah. It's just like, well, you know, it's just, it's not even a Die Hard movie. It's just a generic action movie. And I just, I really disagree with that. I really, really, yeah. really respect what they did with this. Um, in fact, that they, like, the fact that they were looking for something different. I didn't mm -hmm. want to just have it because it's still about John McClane and his relentlessness. It's still like yeah. the, the character beats of it are still the same. He's going to keep going. He's not going to give up. Like that's the whole point of the first movie. Yeah. And it's just so much damn fun. I mean, like I, I, I remember um, I got, I had my bar mitzvah in the morning. I had the, the service and then I had a party and mm -hmm. then my parents were like, you know, it's your day. What do you want to do? And I'm like, I want to go to this restaurant and I want to see Die Hard with a Vengeance. And if you're going to get, if you're going to become a man, that's how you do it. It's not the Jewish service. It's no. you watch Die Hard with that's a Vengeance. That's how you become a man. And I remember it just being this magical day that I'll always remember. Speaking of magical, yeah. we were talking, we were texting over, over while we were watching the movie and you yeah. and me, we both decided that we were going to uh, uh, decide on a favorite character because I talked about how much I love the characters in this movie. I love the Yeah, movie. yeah, there's a lot of fun. Random like, New York like... characters in this movie. Uh, and we're going to see if, if we pick the same one. You wanna, you know? I want you to start because I don't want to take yours and All like right. steal your thunder. Mine is, your... mine is unequivocally the greatly named Joe Zaloom as Jerry the truck driver. Yeah, that was my pick too. Yeah, yeah. The the uh yeah. art, the, with the engineering historical knowledge that the plot needs at just the right moment. But he, yeah. it's such an endearing bit. We love him. We love Jerry. We hope he's we hope he's well. Jerry the truck driver has never had an unhappy day in all of his years. Every Jerry the truck driver is living his best life. Can I do a runner up character? Absolutely. I like um so there's the cop who gets killed by Jeremy Irons thugs yes. who where, who plays his badge number mm -hmm. but there's a scene when the dump trucks are rolling through and the reporters are trying to figure out what's going on oh, yeah. and he kind of like shines them on and mm -hmm. then the one woman reporter just goes you're so full of shit Walsh. <laughs> he like the house he's like thank you yeah, yeah. but her, her delivery of like you're so full of shit it's so great because it's like 
there's out of nowhere this character history between these two where she's heard this bullshit from him so many times. And yeah. again, there's so many things like that in this movie, like the even just yeah. the little interstitial characters, like like the great Graham Greene character actor, you know, American yeah. character actor, uh, has a nice little like scene of great heroism in this movie where he goes into a yeah. school that's about to explode and like like he's just there's all these like the consciences, like McLean's conscience around him all the time, and they all get their little arcs on their own, they'll get their little stories on their own and you know, they all, everybody has something to do. And that's just, I just, that's the, the, the thing that I really was remarking upon watching this, even after having this thing burned into my memory after watching so many times was, man, everybody has something to do. Everybody mm -hmm. always has something to do. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's even just, um, the, the bomb squad guy has got exactly. like the whole thing. I'm going to stop there because I want to talk about the, the, the fucking you want barrels to of fucking? water. I want, no, I want to. No, I'm sorry. I want to talk about the uh, the water jugs. Oh, yeah. We got to talk about the water jugs. Yeah. yeah. The one thing I don't yeah. like about this movie. Yeah. That bothered me so much when I was a kid because I was trying to figure it out. And then, like, every time, even now that I know that it's a cheat, I pause it and I have to, like, go like this and think for, like, two minutes. And I'm just like, well, this. And then they cut. It's a, it's a cheat because they it's cut and they cheat. have, like, yeah. water in one of the jugs already. And unless you had, like, a scale on the jug, there's no way for them to know that it's accurate. And oh, I yeah. don't know. It's a, it's a little thing that the movie, you know, it's, it's a nice, it's actually a really nice little storytelling lesson because it's like you introduce expertise, you introduce um, these riddles, these puzzles where people are genuinely figuring them out, like on my way to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives and all that. Yeah. So then it makes it so much worse when you cheat through editing to get the solution. It feels a little, yeah. Like, that's, the, yeah, that's the one thing that's always bothered me about this movie because I was just like you doing the exact same thing, actually trying to figure it out. And it's not just that you can't without the, su the supplies, it's that when they cut between the scenes, they, when they mm. come back, the water is in different places. It's in different amounts. They cut to the yeah. end. They cheat their way through it. So um, it would have been a little bit better to have that actually be solved um, genuinely. A yeah. couple other quick things. John McTiernan directs the hell out of this movie. Pretty First much time. nobody could handle an action movie like he could back then. And then also, I miss Michael Kamen so much. Like, yeah. my God, like, did I, like, I've always enjoyed this score, but like, it just makes you think of like how great his action scores were back in the day so yeah there's an urgency to it it's like it's like it's a nice there's it's like i was thinking about it, it I think like I jaunty and playful and it's, stuff it's too a, yeah. the thing i kept thinking was working class it's like a working class action score you know what i mean it's mm. like it's upbeat it's jaunty you're getting through your day like i mean it really is a day like it's a work day for john mcclain and yeah. there's you know, all these other people throughout their work day and there's like a working class element to the to the score which i don't even know if it makes any sense but in my head it makes sense to me and I can't listen to Summer in the City by Love and Spoonful oh, without, man. like, at the point, while, say, say it's on Sirius XM or something like that. If I hear it, I'm just like, wheezing at the bus stop, boom. <laughs> like, the song might as well not even continue. I'm like, that's the end of the song. Yeah. That's the end of the song. But I do think just genuinely and like and, and hearing the way that in the, in the years people have talked about this movie or maybe mm -hmm. dismissed it or, or, you know, I think it became kind of sort of contrarian and punk rock to, to embrace uh, Die Hard 2. Um, not that it's not good, not that it's not fun, but yeah. um, this one, I mean, to me, is just unequivocally the best of the sequels. I, I, there are times where you, if you ask me which was my favorite Die Hard movie, you catch me on the right day, I might say this one. Um, okay. You know what I mean? Just yeah. because it's, it's different enough from the first one where there are two different flavors. The writing is very different. And there is something about me that maybe sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes prefers this kind of a little bit more narratively fast paced, you know, more sort of larger scale adventure as opposed to the sort of perfect sort of symmetry of the first Die Hard. Yeah, I'm always going to take the original, but like of the sequels, if you catch me at Christmas, I'll want to watch Die Hard 2. If you catch sure. me during the summer, I'll want to watch Die Hard with a Vengeance. 100%. So. All right. Well, uh, this was really fun, and we will be back for one more June's exploitation review. It's for a uh, free space day, so Rob and I are going to watch a movie that neither of us has seen, um, but we kind of always wanted to see or were always curious about, so we're watching Shakes the Clown, so we will be back next week with that one. Right. Until next time, Rob. These seats will explode. And P.S., I went to Yankee Stadium once in 2012, and to the left of you and to the right of you, obviously, is the Bronx. And when I looked around, I was just like, it looks like Die Hard with a Vengeance down here. 
And that was pretty cool.